Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you have been sitting in the back row, or if this is your first time here, and you are enjoying what you are hearing, please don't hesitate to hit that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all. That way you know every time I upload a video. Also, if you enjoy what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee, or if you're interested in becoming a member, the information can be found down below in the description box. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this eight-part series that will be broken up over two videos entitled The Sixth Floor. Right after this intro, an ad will play. Right before I read the first story, an ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. A quick note, as I said before, these stories will be broken into two videos because they are just that long. Are you ready? Let's get to it. Forewarning, do not go to the sixth floor. Welcome to the Patterson's Motel. On the fourth floor, there's two beds and one TV with a bathroom and a small kitchen. John Lee Carson, age 46, killed himself with a gun and his girlfriend with an ax on this very bed. I said into my recorder, my words echoed through the room like thunder, each syllable infused with a palpable intensity that had everyone's attention captive. They say the reason why he killed her is because he was doing a sacrifice. But for what? My voice carried a weight of mysteriousness, as if I already had the answer within my grasp. Stay tuned to the horrors that wait in this haunted place. I announced, my voice tinged with theatricality. With a click, I ended the recording, shedding my facade and collapsing onto the bed, exhaustion weighing very heavy on my weary frame. Lying on my back, staring at the ceiling, my phone suddenly rings. I reached up to answer it. Hello? Ah, yes, I've stumbled upon your location worth investigating, he explained eagerly. Quick, fire up your laptop. It's the perfect material for your book. Okay, what's the name of it? I ask, my curiosity piqued. Ah, it's called the Grand Dolphin Hotel, he replied, the excitement evident in his voice. Hmm, I'll definitely look into it, I responded, already intrigued by the prospect. I'm going to have to call you back. I'm going to look it up right now, I said, reaching into my bag for my Samsung laptop as I hung up. I powered on my laptop, greeted by the familiar welcome screen. Navigating to Google, I typed in Grand Dolphin Hotel to begin my search. As I scrolled through the search results, my eyes landed on a striking image of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Its majestic presence dominated the skyline. A tall skyscraper adorned in regal white and gold. Gargoyle statues perched on each corner of the roof. Their dragon-like wings and pointed ears carved meticulously into the stone. Amidst the bustling cityscape, the Grand Dolphin Hotel stood as a beacon of beauty and elegance. Intrigued, I noted the address. 456 East End Street, New York, New York, 10021. Hmm, New York, I muttered, my surprise evident in my tone. Now let's see what's so mysterious about the Grand Dolphin Hotel, I muttered to myself. My curiosity peaked as I eagerly anticipated unraveling its enigmatic allure. My fingers pressed the keys as I typed, Grand Dolphin Hotel History. I clicked search and waited for the best results. When it finally popped up, I had gotten more than what I bargained for. The first thing that caught my eye was the article. 
Do not go on the second floor. Here's why. I stared at the decks before me. Being skeptical, I shrugged the warning, knowing I don't believe in ghosts nor demons. I finally clicked on the article, and what I got was very interesting. Unraveling the Enigma of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. The Grand Dolphin Hotel, a prominent fixture in New York City, has captivated the imaginations of locals and tourists alike for generations. Established by Stephen Hanks on October 6, 1906, and opened to the public on December 6, 1966, this historic landmark holds more than just luxurious accommodations. It holds a very dark secret. The hotel's sixth floor has become infamous over the years, its history married by a series of inexplicable tragedies. One such incident occurred in room 69, where Henry Morrison, a 34-year-old college professor, was discovered dead with a knife in his hand. Despite investigators ruling it a homicide, speculation surrounding the circumstances of his demise persisted and he also was the only one on the sixth floor. The sixth floor garnered further attention in 1934 when it was dubbed the Devil's Floor due to its association with the number six, reminiscent of the biblical 666. However, the true horror unfolded when 200 individuals staying on the sixth floor were tragically found dead the following day all having taken their own lives. This shocking event led to the temporary closure of the hotel as authorities grappled with the inexplicable loss of life. Upon reopening, the hotel took drastic measures to address the haunting rumors surrounding the sixth floor. It remained sealed off to guests, shrouded in mystery and speculation. While some dismiss the notion of a haunted hotel as mere superstition, others remain wary of the chilling warnings associated with the Grand Dolphin's hotel's sixth floor. Till this day, the Grand Dolphin Hotel remained open. Sounds interesting. This will definitely boost my book sales, I remarked to myself, a sense of anticipation tingling within me. This room is definitely not haunted. I assured myself, casting a quick glance around the room to dispel any lingering doubt. With a sense of determination, I made the decision to retire for the night, knowing what big plans awaited me at the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Awoken by the incessant beeping of my alarm clock, I swung my hand to silence the intrusive sound. Despite my efforts, a wave of drowsiness and lightheadedness washed over me as I struggled to fully awaken. Squinting at my phone, I noticed the time flashing 10.45 a.m., confirming my lateness. Rubbing my eyes to banish the lingering blur of sleep, I reluctantly rose from the bed, my movements sluggish. With a sigh, I retrieved my bag from the adjacent bed, where it lay patiently waiting. Hastily gathering my essentials, I grabbed my toothbrush and toothpaste before shuffling towards the bathroom, the premise of a refreshing routine beckoning me forward. After finishing my morning routine, I grabbed my bag and phone from the dresser and made my way out of the bathroom. As I walked, a sense of purpose stirred within me. I remembered my unfinished recording, but the previous story felt lackluster. However, the allure of the Grand Dolphin Hotel promised excitement and intrigue, making it the perfect subject to captivate my audience. Stepping into the elevator, I pressed the button for the first floor, accompanied by the familiar beeping signaling its descent. Upon reaching my destination, the door slid open with another beep, and I made my way to the front desk to inform the attendant of my intention to check out. Hello, how can I assist you today, Mr. Blackwood? She greeted with a professional demeanor, 
her tone crisp and businesslike. Um, yes, I would like to check out. I'm heading out today, I replied, eager to begin my next adventure. Uh, oh, of course. What's your room number? She asked, her tone polite yet professional. Room 122, I replied, stating my room number with clarity. As she began typing on the keyboard, the satisfying clicks filled the air. Okay, Mr. Blackwood, that would be $133, she replied, her voice maintaining its professional tone. I reached into my pocket, retrieving my wallet, and proceeded to count out the necessary amount. Once the cash was in hand, I handed it over to her, completing the transaction. Thank you for staying at Patterson Motel. Have a safe trip, she said offering a warm smile as I prepared to depart. Part 2 Walking out into the parking lot, I reached for my keys and pressed the unlock button, eliciting a satisfying beep. Making my way to my car, I dropped my bag onto the passenger seat before sliding into the driver's seat of my black Toyota. With a soothing motion, I closed the door, inserted the keys into the ignition, twisting them to bring the car to life. I shifted the car into reverse, checking mirrors before carefully maneuvering out of the parking spot. Once clear, I drove off, ready to embark on the next leg of my journey. Arriving at my workplace, Page Turner Solutions, I parked on the side and switched off the engine. Retrieving my bag from the passenger seat, I stepped out of the car, ensuring to lock it before making my way onto the bustling sidewalk. With purposeful strides, I entered the building, navigating my way up the stairs to the left and opening the door into my workplace. Upon entering Page Turner Solutions, the air hummed with creative energy. Natural light flooded the spacious room casting a warm glow over the modern furnishings. Desks lined the perimeter, each adorned with stacks of manuscripts and bustling with activity. In one corner, a group of editors huddled around a conference table, engaged in lively discussion. The walls were adorned with colorful posters showcasing upcoming book releases, while shelves groaned under the weight of the countless volumes. The atmosphere buzzed with excitement, a testament to the passion and dedication of those who called this place home. As I sank into my chair, exhaustion weighed heavily on me, prompting me to rest my hand on the desk. The rhythmic sound of approaching footsteps signaled the arrival of my friend, their familiar voice offering a sense of comfort. Hey, Alex, what's up? Did you go fishing already? With your paranormal investigation? My friend exclaimed, his tone playful and lively. I lifted my head, my expression still marked by weariness. Nah, I didn't. It was boring, to be honest, I replied, my voice rough with fatigue. So... What's next then? he asked, a smile playing on his lips, his demeanor friendly and inviting. I got a call from my boss, I replied, offering a brief smile. He told me I should investigate the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Oh, oh I remember that place, he chuckled, a hint of apprehension in his tone. <laughs> um... I heard so many stories about it as a kid, but I'll tell you what, Alex, I'm not about to go investigating anything paranormal, especially not something as big as the Grand Dolphin Hotel. 200 people killing themselves on the sixth floor? <laughs> Hell no, he exclaimed, his laughter tinged with unease. Well, as a white writer with nothing else to do with my life, I see it as a win, I replied, joining in with a short laugh. Is there any food in the lounge? I'm a little hungry, I inquired, feeling the pain of hunger gnawing at me. Uh, yeah, they um, brought donuts. There's about, I don't know, six or seven boxes back there, 
he replied casually. I might steal them all. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I said humorously with a chuckle. Well, you know me. I saw nothing, he equipped, turning around and walking off. I chuckled quietly to myself before heading out to the lunchroom. Making my way out, I walked to the end of the hall and turned right, heading towards the first door labeled Boot Lounge. Grabbing the doorknob, it clicked and let me in. The room was eerily empty as I stepped inside, the only sound being the faint hum of the air conditioner. Six tables still scattered around the room, with an icebox nestled in one corner and a microwave perched on the counter. The tantalizing aroma of freshly baked donuts wafted from the countertop where they lay in tempting piles. Without hesitation, I approached the donuts, selecting four of them before grabbing a plate and warming them up in the microwave. Once they were heated to perfection, I carefully placed them on my plate and tidied up the area before making my way back to my desk, ready to enjoy my meal. Sitting at my desk, I finished my food and wiped my hands clean with napkins before using hand sanitizer to cleanse them thoroughly. As I looked up, I noticed my boss entering the room, his smile widening upon seeing me, clearly pleased to see me. As he approached, my boss inquired, Have you made room reservations yet? Um, not yet. I was just eating. I'll call them up now. What's the number? I replied. My boss reached for his phone to look up the number, and as my fingers danced across the screen, he called out the digits. 409-455-8756. All righty, I got it. I'll put it on speaker too, I affirmed, punching in the numbers and pressing enter as the phone buzzed, waiting for a response. Part 3 Phone answers. Automated voice. Thank you for calling the Grand Dolphin Hotel, where luxury meets elegance. For reservations, press 1. For room service, press 2. For concierge assistance, press 3. For all other inquiries, please press 4. User presses 4. Automated voice. Thank you for choosing to speak with our guest services team. Please hold while we connect you. Soft instrumental music plays. Automatic voice. Your call is important to us. All of our representatives are currently assisting other customers. Please continue to hold and we'll be with you shortly. After a brief pause, automated voice. Thank you for your patience. You are now being connected to a member of our guest services team. Call connects. Guest services representative. Good morning and thank you for calling the Grand Dolphin Hotel. My name is Miss Brooks. How may I assist you today? User. Hello? I, w I would like to rent a room. Of course, sir. Thank you for choosing the Grand Dolphin Hotel. May I have the name and date you'd like to reserve a room for? My name is Alex Blackwood. I would like to book a room for today, May 23rd, preferably on the sixth floor. I replied over the phone, conveying my request clearly. Thank you, Mr. Blackwood, for providing your information. We can certainly accommodate your request for a room on May 23rd. However, I must inform you that, due to ongoing renovations, the sixth floor is currently unavailable for reservations. Would you prefer a room on a different floor? No thanks. I specifically want a room on the sixth floor, I asserted firmly, reiterating my preference to the person on the other end of the line. I understand your preference, Mr. Blackwood. However, I'm afraid the sixth floor is temporarily closed for renovations, and we are unable to accommodate any reservations for that floor at the moment. Is there any other floor you would consider? Confusion clouded my expression as I glanced at my boss, only to find the demeanor shifting to one of anger. With a soft whisper, he uttered, Let me take the phone. Hello, this is his boss. What seems to be the issue? 
my boss inquired, his demeanor radiating authority as he took control of the situation. Hello, sir. I apologize for the inconvenience, but it seems we may have lost the connection momentarily. As I was explaining to Mr. Blackwood, the sixth floor is currently undergoing renovations and is unavailable for reservations. Would you like me to assist you with any other inquiries? No. He specifically asked for the sixth floor. Give him what he requested, or we'll take this to court. He asserted firmly, his tone leaving no room for negotiation. I understand your concern, sir. However, for the safety and comfort of our guests, we could not accommodate reservations for the sixth floor at this time. We have a wide range of other luxurious rooms available on different floors that I would be happy to assist Mr. Blackwood in booking. Can I help you with any other arrangements? Connect me to your boss. I have something to say to him. He demanded with authority his tone brooking no argument. Of course, sir. Please hold for a moment while I connect you to my supervisor. The call is placed on hold. This is Mr. Hawkins. How may I assist you? My worker asked for a room on the sixth floor, and your front desk lady isn't letting him have the room, he responded. I apologize for any inconvenience, sir. However, as I'm sure my colleague explained, the sixth floor is currently closed for renovations. We prioritize the safety and comfort of our guests, and unfortunately, we cannot make exceptions at this time. I understand your concerns, and I assure you that we have a wide range of other luxurious rooms available on different floors. Is there anything else I can assist with you today? He's a journalist, and you have to accommodate his request for the room. It's essential for his job. So give him the room, or I'll take you to court. It's the law, so you have to comply, he demanded assertively, citing legal obligation. I understand your concern, sir. Given the importance of Mr. Blackwood's work as a journalist, we are willing to make an exception and accommodate his request for the sixth floor. However, I must emphasize that the decision is solely for this particular circumstance and does not set a precedent for future reservations. Thank you for bringing this to our attention, and we appreciate your understanding. That's what I thought, he replied, his tone filled with satisfaction as the matter was resolved in our favor. Certainly, sir. When Mr. Blackwood arrives, he can inform the front desk, and we will arrange for him to meet with me in my office. Is there a specific time that works best for him, or should we coordinate upon his arrival? Yes, he'll be there now, my boss responded, acknowledging the directive. Thank you for confirming, sir. We look forward to Mr. Blackwood's arrival. If you have any further questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out. Have a pleasant day. The supervisor hangs up the call. <laughs> uh, wow, they were... They were hard to convince, I replied with a short laugh, relieved that the matter had been resolved. Well, it's best you get down there now since we told him you'll be there immediately. And be safe too, my boss reiterated, underscoring the importance of both promptness and safety. Well, all right, I said, rising from my seat. I grabbed my bag and keys from my desk before making my way downstairs to my car. Sitting in the driver's seat, I took a moment to look up the address, mindful of the fact that I lived in New Haven. On my way to the hotel, I found myself waiting at a traffic light. For where I sat, I could see the Grand Dolphin Hotel towering in the distance, its brilliance standing out amidst the surrounding buildings. Now I understand why they called it the Grand Dolphin Hotel. It truly was a marvel. As the light turned green, I pressed the gas pedal, making my way towards the hotel entrance. Pulling into the driveway, I was greeted by a hotel assistant dressed in impeccable attire. May I take your car, sir? He asked in a professional tone. Uh, of course, just don't scratch my car, I replied, tossing him the keys as I stepped out of the vehicle. 
Walking towards the entrance, as I was walking inside, I was welcomed by the golden glass doors, which opened to reveal a very luxurious red carpet, inviting me into the opulent surroundings of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. As I stepped through the golden glass doors of the Grand Dolphin Hotel, I found myself enveloped in an atmosphere of opulence and grandeur. The lobby stretched out before me, adorned with lavish furnishings and intricate details that spoke of luxury. To my left, a gleaming marble reception desk stood, manned by impeccably dressed staff ready to assist guests with their needs. Crystal chandeliers hung from the ceiling, casting a warm and inviting glow over the space. The walls were adorned with ornate artwork and intricate tapestries, adding to the sense of elegance. In the center of the lobby, a grand piano took pride of place. Its polished surface gleamed under the soft lighting, and the rich tones of classical music filled the air as a skilled pianist played effortless grace. The melody danced through the room, adding to the ambience and elevating the experience for guests. Around the perimeter of the lobby, plush seating arrangements beckoned weary travelers to rest and relax. Luxurious sofas and armchairs upholstered in rich fabrics provided a comfortable space to unwind, while occasional tables adorned with fresh flowers and elegant decor added a touch of sophistication. As I took to the side of the lobby, I couldn't help but be impressed by the attention to detail and the sense of refinement that permeated every single corner. The Grand Dolphin Hotel truly lived up to its name offering a luxurious and unforgettable experience from the moment guests step through its doors. The roof of the Grand Dolphins Hotel's lobby soared overhead, a masterpiece of architectural design. Constructed of intricately carved wood and adorned with delicate moldings, it created a sense of grandeur and spaciousness. The ceiling rose to great heights, supported by elegant columns that added to the room's majestic ambience. Hanging from the ceilings were several magnificent chandeliers, each a work of its own in its own right. Crafted from sparkling crystal and intricately wrought metal, they cascaded from the ceiling in the dazzling display of opulence. The chandeliers cast a warm, inviting glow over the lobby, their light reflecting off the polished marble floors below. As guests moved through the lobby, they couldn't help but be captivated by the beauty and grandeur of the chandeliers, their twinkling lights adding to the magical atmosphere of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Whether admiring the intricate details of the ceiling or basking in the soft glow of the chandeliers, visitors were sure to be transported to a world of luxury and sophistication. Walking up to the desk, I stood in line behind a lady, patiently waiting my turn. After a few minutes, it was finally my chance to speak. Hello, I paid for a room on the sixth floor. I was told that you're supposed to lead me to your boss or the owner of the place, I said, maintaining a professional demeanor. She nodded and grabbed the phone, dialing a number. Hello, Mr. Hawkins? He's here for the sixth floor, she said into the receiver. After a brief pause, she listened to the response before replying. Yeah, of course, I'll let him know. Hanging up the phone, she looked up at me with a professional smile. He'll be up shortly. Make sure you take a seat. Thank you for coming to the Grand Dolphin Hotel, she said, her smile warm and welcoming. I returned her smile and complied with her request, making my way to a seat in the lobby. As I settled into the comfortable chair, I immersed myself in the soothing strains of classical piano music that echoed throughout the room, reminiscent of tunes from the 80s. The elegant melody filled the air, transporting me to a world of tranquility and refinement as I waited Mr. Hawking's arrival. 
After a few minutes of waiting, I was greeted by Mr. Hawkins. Nice to meet you, sir, he said, extending his hand for a handshake. I reached out my hand to give him a handshake. As I was fixing to introduce myself, he cut me off. I already know your name. I'm a big fan of your books, Mr. Blackwood, he said with a smile, releasing his hand. Come with me to my office to discuss further details, he said, motioning me to follow him. Part 4 As I followed him into his office, it took a couple of minutes to reach our destination, as his office was located on the first floor of the hotel. We arrived at his office, and he opened the door, gesturing towards a seat at his desk. In Mr. Hawkins' windowless office, the atmosphere was more intimate and focused. Soft overhead lighting illuminated the space, casting a warm and inviting glow. The walls were adorned with elegant artwork, adding a touch of sophistication to the room. The centerpiece of the office was undoubtedly Mr. Hawkins' mahogany desk, which dominated the space with its stately presence. Behind the desk, a sleek leather chair stood, inviting guests to take a seat and engage in conversation. A small bookshelf against one wall held a selection of reference materials and industry literature reflecting Mr. Hawkins' dedication to his profession. A few tasteful decorative pieces adorned the shelves, adding a personal touch to the space. Overall, with lacking in natural light, Mr. Hawkins' office exuded an aura of professionalism and refinement, providing a comfortable and conducive environment for conducting business discussions. Sitting down, Mr. Hawkins retrieved a key from his drawer and unlocked a safe situated in the corner of the room. With a practiced hand, he swung open the heavy door and reached inside, pulling out a large file from within. Seated across from Mr. Hawkins, I maintained a calm and composed demeanor, though inwardly I couldn't help but feel a sense of anticipation. I met his gaze steadily, waiting for him to speak, knowing deep down what he would likely say. Despite the charade, I was prepared to play along, ready to engage in whatever discussion lay ahead. In that file, Mr. Blackwood... There is some disturbing information, and I want to be honest with you. I promise you, you do not want to stay on the sixth floor. I urge you to take a look at these files so it can help you change your mind. Mr. Hawking said with a straight face, his tone serious and convincing, maintaining a professional demeanor. As Mr. Hawkins slid the file across the desk to me, I reached out and grabbed it feeling a sense of apprehension as I opened to the very first page. My eyes fell upon an image of a janitor. The photo appeared to have been taken around 1967 or somewhere around that time. What was shocking about the image was that the janitor seemed to have managed to stab himself in the throat with a broom. Wow, I muttered, a reaction of mix of shock and disbelief. Yeah, it can be overwhelming. He was found dead six days later, Mr. Hawkins explained, his expression serious and somber. Where was he found? I questioned, my curiosity peaked. Near the elevator. It took a while to get rid of the blood stains. he answered, his tone grave. I turned to the next page and my eyes fell upon a chilling image. A man in a suit with a tie lay sprawled out on the ground, his arms slit open as if with a knife. And that, Mr. Hawkins explained, his voice tinged with solemnity, is Professor Peterson. He was found dead in room 211 on the sixth floor. Law enforcement ruled it as a homicide. I flipped to the next page and heart-wrenching scene greeted my eyes. In the photograph were two children, a boy and a girl, along with a woman who appeared to be their mother. The boy looked to be around 14 or 15 years of age, while the girl seemed to be about seven or nine. 
The mother, who appeared to be in her 40s, lay lifeless on the ground outside of the hotel. Her face was partially mangled from the fall, and her limbs appeared broken from the impact with the concrete pavement. Besides her, the two children were hung limply from a rope, their necks bearing clear marks from where the rope had constricted them. The mother killed herself. She jumped out the window. The two kids hung themselves using a rope. Mr. Hawkins explained, his voice heavy with sorrow as he recounted the tragic events. But I urge you not to stay on the sixth floor. It's very dangerous. Mr. Hawkins reiterated, his tone filled with genuine concern. I'm still going to go. I don't believe it's anything supernatural. Trust me, I responded firmly, standing by my decision and dismissing their tales as mere superstition. At least take this file with you, Mr. Hawkins requested. Sure thing, Mr. Hawkins, I replied, nodding in agreement as I picked up the file and tucked it under my arm. Mr. Hawkins opened the drawer and retrieved an old-fashioned key clearly not one for the modern electric keypads used on hotel room doors. Modern electric keypads don't work on any of the doors on the sixth floor. I'm not going to accompany you there, but I'll take you there, he explained, his expression serious as he handed me the key. As we walked out, Mr. Hawkins led me to an elevator. We entered together, and a lady joined us. She pressed the button for floor 10, before exiting the elevator. Once she left, Mr. Hawkins guided his finger to the button marked six. It stood out from the others with its old fashioned design, contrasting with the modern blue LED buttons for the other floors. Riding the elevator, I found myself fixated on the digital display as it counted down from 10 to six. Each number seemed to pass by agonizingly slow, heightening the sense of anticipation and unease that gripped me. With each ding marking our descent, my heart seemed to beat a little faster. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, the elevator came to a halt. The doors slid open with a drawn-out creak, revealing the ominous sixth floor beyond. Looking out, the sixth floor appeared deceptively ordinary, with rows of doors lining each side of the hallway. The corridor itself was clean and well-maintained, yet it seemed strangely devoid of life, eerily quiet in contrast to the bustling activity of the floors below. The carpet, with its old-school design, evoked a sense of nostalgia, giving off an unmarkable 80s vibe that added to the surreal atmosphere of the floor. Despite its outward appearance of normalcy, an underlying sense of unease lingered in the air. I caught a glimpse of the wallpaper lining the hallway. It was a riot of color and pattern, with geometric shapes and various shades of beige and brown, accented by bursts of mustard yellow and burnt orange. The design repeated in a dizzying array of shapes, creating a mesmerizing visual effect that seemed to dance before my eyes. Despite its outdated appearance, there was a certain nostalgic charm to the wallpaper, a relic of a bygone era frozen in time within the walls of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Last chance to turn back, Mr. Hawking said, his words carrying a weighty air of foreboding. Ignoring Mr. Hawking's ominous warning, I stepped out of the elevator onto the sixth floor. Pausing, I turned around to ask one final question. Where is my room number? I inquired. Room 144, he replied tensely, his expression unreadable as he pressed the button to close the elevator doors with a soft chime. The doors slid shut, leaving me alone in this eerily quiet hallway. As I walked towards my room door, a sense of unease settled over me like a heavy shroud. Mr. Hawkins' warning echoed in my mind, casting a shadow of doubt and apprehension over my decision to stay on the sixth floor. Every step felt heavier 
Every creak on the floorboards seemed to amplify the silence that enveloped me. Despite my attempts to brush off the feeling, an eerie chill ran down my spine, and I couldn't shake the nagging sense of foreboding that lingered in the air. As I approached my room, my senses heightened, and I noticed a woman in a white, old-fashioned gown cradling a baby as she disappeared into the room next to mine. The sound of a baby's cries pierced the air, echoing down the hallway until the door closed behind her. Confusion clouded my thoughts. Hadn't Mr. Hawkins assured me that no one else was on this floor? I stood frozen in place, the weight of uncertainty pressing down on me. I kept walking towards my destination. I carefully retrieved the key from my pocket, ensuring not to drop the file tucked under my arm. With trembling hands, I inserted the key into the lock of room 144. The click of the lock turning seemed to reverberate throughout the entire quiet hallway. Taking a deep breath, I grasped the doorknob and slowly pushed the door open, stealing myself for whatever awaited me on the other side. As I opened the door wider, I stepped into the hotel room and took in my surroundings. It appeared to be a standard, albeit slightly dated, room. The wallpaper featured intriguing geometric shapes lending the space its retro charm. The walls were painted a somber shade of dark gray, adding to the room's subdued atmosphere. In the center of the room, a couch and a recliner sat opposite each other, flanking a small table. A modest 12-inch TV hung on the wall, and its plastic casing showing signs of wear and tear. On either side of the TV hung paintings, one depicting a serene cruise ship with passengers enjoying their vacation, while the other depicted the very room I was standing in, every detail meticulously captured with uncanny precision. Despite the familiarity of the scene, a sense of unease lingered in the air, casting a shadow over the otherwise ordinary room. I made my way toward the bedroom area, located at the back of the room, noting the absence of a door separating it from the main living space. Another TV, noticeably older in model, greeted me, evoking a sense of nostalgia with its 1960s design. The bed, lightly made up with three neatly arranged pillows, stood as the centerpiece of the bedroom. Despite the inviting appearance, a subtle sense of disquiet lingered in the air, amplifying the feeling of unease that had been gnawing at me since my arrival on the sixth floor. With recorder in hand, I began to document my surroundings, each click and word capturing the essence of the mysterious sixth floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel. Hello everyone, my name is Alex Blackwood and I am here to investigate the enigmatic sixth floor of the Grand Dolphin Hotel, also known as the Devil's Floor. I announce my voice taking on a mysterious tone to captivate my audience. With every word, I aim to draw my listeners deeper into the unfolding mystery of the notorious location. As I walk toward my room door, a sense of unease settled over me like a heavy shroud. Mr. Hawking's warnings echoed in my mind, casting a shadow of doubt and apprehension over my decision to stay on the sixth floor. Every step felt heavier. Every creak of the floorboards seemed to amplify the silence that enveloped me. Despite my attempts to brush off the feeling, an eerie chill ran down my spine, and I could not shake the nagging sense of foreboding that lingered in the air. As I approached my room, my senses heightened. I noticed a woman in a white, old-fashioned gown, cradling a baby as she disappeared into the room next to mine. The sound of the baby's cries pierced the air, echoing down the hallway until the door closed behind her. Confusion clouded my thoughts. Hadn't Mr. Hawkins assured me 
that no one else was on this floor. I stood frozen in place and the weight of uncertainty pressing down on me. I kept walking towards my destination. I carefully retrieved the key from my pocket and suing not to drop the file tucked under my arm. With trembling hands, I inserted the key into the lock of room 144. And that, dear listeners, is a to-be-continued on this special series entitled The Sixth Floor. If this video for any reason flops, I may not read the other parts, but we will see what happens. At this moment, I would like to acknowledge all of the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Sugared Spike, Tina Mead, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Matt Davies, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Colt Stonewolf, Luz Crispin, Samantha Place, Patty Sneeze, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your continued support of Back to Ashes, for without you, there would be no me or this channel. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed the series so far. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. Be careful out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.